Hello and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we are talking about art markets and I got a lot of questions about this after I did the other art fair in Dallas. I've done several different art markets and art events and a question I get over and over again is are they worth it? And this is a great question because they often are an investment. You have to pay quite a bit of money to join and it makes sense. Is it worth the time and effort spent? How much money do you get back? What's the process like? And I thought in this video I could answer some of those questions. I will say this is more of a my perspective type thing. If you want to do more research, I would look into the organization that you're wanting to show work with and ask them for their numbers. What are sales like? Do you have any artists who I can talk to? Look at the roster from last year, reach out to them, that kind of a thing. So with that, with that little precursor, I will just hop right into my experience and my thoughts and my takeaway. So first I wanna talk about my experience. I did some footage from the other art fair, so I thought I would share some of that with you guys and that way you can kind of visualize what it's like. Again, I've done other art fairs, I just made sure to document this one a little bit better. But basically it was a four day art fair, which means it took place over four days. Of course the preparation took much longer. To sign up you had to get approved. There was an approval process and I submitted the body of work that I wanted to show, my most cohesive body of work at that time was my teenage still life and dollar store painting, stuff that kind of went along with that. I proposed an artist statement, I submitted an artist bio, and this was months in advance. I will say COVID sort of made this take a lot longer. I think we were slated for spring of 2020 and it got kicked down the road until fall of 21. So it was a long time, but that's not normal, but usually, you know, you have several months to maybe even a year of runway up into the event. I was approved, very happy for that. I believe there was a fee to see if you were approved. The fee was relatively small compared to the total cost of everything. I think it was less than $100 and the total cost was closer to $4,000. So with the other art fair, there is a breakdown in money, which means that whenever you sell something, Part of that sale is going to go to Saatchi. So I believe it was 30% went to Saatchi, which is pretty good because a typical gallery cut is 50-50, 50% to the artist, 50% to the gallery. And so them only taking 30 or 40% is pretty good, um, all things considered. They also request that if you get any commissions from the other art fair that you use the honor system and credit them back that money. That is a moral issue. I will leave that up to you, but that is kind of what they ask and request. And we have to remember that they're trying to have a business so that they can pay people to do the marketing and help artists. So it's, it's really, you know, I feel like it's mostly a very altruistic, helpful thing that they're doing. And if you can afford to give back, I think that's wonderful. But knowing the breakdown is something really important. Also, the way that they'll pay is they bring a slip of paper that you fill out with the price, the name of the artwork, um, and all of your information up to a booth where they will pay. So they'll give them their card or their cash or however they're paying. And then they come back with the slip and they pick up the art and they leave. You can also, I think they can wrap the artwork for you. So they offer a lot of great stuff for the customer, but that's typically how that happens. It's always a little bit different from art market to art market. I've done art markets where once you pay the fee, anything that you earn is 100% yours. I've done art markets where they request 10% back and you have to show receipts of what you made and all that stuff. So it really depends on the art market. Of course, that's something that you need to factor in. So once you're approved, you then get to start to choose what kind of booth size you want, how you want your setup to look and everything like that. They have, um, usually when you do these art fairs, they have some people who it's their job to help the artist establish their booth and figure out what they want, paint the walls if that's something that you want and really just help you get things set up. But I will say for the most part, you as an artist, it's your job to kind of visualize what you want conceptualize what artwork you want to bring. I definitely would suggest doing research. I think one piece of advice I wish I would have known is the kind of audience that Dallas had. I am an artist out of Austin. Conceptually think of myself more as like an internet artist, meaning that I'm based out of Austin, but I do a lot of selling and uh, marketing through the internet. And so my work is a little less place sensitive. I don't do a lot of like Austin art or Texas art. I think I wish I would have known Dallas was kind of a hub for interior designers and also Dallas has a little bit more of a older 
slightly more conservative in the sense of artistic taste, you know, more muted colors and sunsets and landscapes, less ring pop paintings. <laughs> so I wish I would have done some research because I think I would have brought a different body of work. That being said, that being said, I still think it was a pretty cohesive body of work and I will go into other reasons I'm glad I picked that body of work later. But if my main objective was to sell work, I definitely would have tailored what I brought to the Dallas market a little bit more. So the next thing I did when I started to conceptualize what I wanted my booth to look like was I had to pick out my sizes. And this is usually where the initial payment starts to come in. With the other art fair, you did a initial payment and then you did a final payment. I believe it was broken up into two. I do think there may have been other payment plans, but that was the one that I chose to do. It was kind of weird though, because with the other art fair, the situation I had because of COVID, they kept refunding and then they retake it out, which can be really stressful. Another piece of advice I would suggest is try to stay in communication. We had a group email thread and the payments were kind of weird and so people were able to use that to get in touch with Saatchi and figure out what the payment was doing and help keep people pretty informed. So another piece of advice I would have is to try and stay in contact with people as much as possible, but that shouldn't normally happen. I think that was really COVID times were sort of making all of this more complicated than it needed to be. Um, and also if you're operating on more of a budget, that's going to be obviously more important for you to know. Again, I'm going to emphasize staying communicate with people running it. You can even reach out privately and say, hey, this is my circumstances. I am, I only have X amount of money in my bank account. And if you pull it at random times, it's going to really mess with me. So if you guys can give me a heads up, that's something that I certainly would feel comfortable doing and saying there's no shame in that artist is a hard job to get off the ground so um, reaching out in that way probably would have been pretty helpful but that being said once all the payment was pulled it was usually based on the size booth that you selected so i if I remember right, there was five booth sizes at the Dallas Other Art Fair. Anything from a pretty small, like six feet by three feet type setup, all the way up to like a 20 foot type setup. I believe I went with the second from the largest and that worked really well with me. I had a lot of really large pieces and I just was able to afford that, take that risk, which is why I ultimately selected a really large booth. So you select your booth size and from that point on everything is pretty much in your domain. You have to figure out how you want to decorate your booth, what art you want to bring. Usually you propose it with a body of work. Some places are more hands off. I've done art markets that were pretty much just you get your booth, you get your tent and then you show up and the artist is really responsible for most of the, the stuff. So at that point, it's really important to do some research. Now I will link a couple of places that have really good booth setup information. One person is an artist that I, I love and adore. Her name's Kathleen Freshly and she has some really good blog posts about her setup at art markets. She does more outdoor type art markets so she has really good information on that. Mine was indoor and so I didn't have to worry about booth stuff as much. I really just had to show up with my artwork and my wallpaper and set it up but there's lots of good options and I can't emphasize enough doing research. So at this point, you've done your research, you have your booth paid. Now, what do you do? At this point, I made some work specifically for the other art fair and for the show. I made sure to do a lot of really good marketing for that. And marketing basically, it just means tell your audience, tell your fans, try to create some excitement around what you're showing and build some hype. And that's exactly what I did. I made some new pieces and I made sure leading up to the other art fair that I talked about it pretty frequently. I also reached out to my email list and TikTok and Instagram both and just communicated what I was doing and try to get people to come and see you. It's, you know, your followers and your curators. Hold on. <clears throat> Basically just try to get people to see you. At the other art fair, they had one night that was uh, special for collectors. So people who already had bought some of your work or were very interested in you, you could do a private invite. I think it was like on Thursday night. And that's a great way to make some sales. People who already like your work are probably going to be a little more likely to buy from you. So make sure to utilize that. It's basically someone else is throwing a party. You just get to show up and entertain your fans who already love your artwork. The next part is driving your artwork up. So I have a another artist who lives in town with me here in this little town right outside Boston. And we went halfsies on a U-Haul and 
packed up our own stuff and then we shared a van and she was able to drive up with the van and we both met on Thursday to unload and put our art up and we were both able to share the U-Haul on the way back and that was really helpful so if you can buddy up and find friends the art community is already pretty close it's a great way to really get to know people and share costs as much as possible most of us are kind of in the similar boat of like working on a bit of a shoestring budget and so it's a great way to cut costs i definitely recommend doing that so whenever i set up i went up with my husband and my two kids we always do these kind of like family style we really don't have child care and so the kids come with us it's it's stressful in the moment like if you have the option to have your parents watch your kids or something do that <laughs> But we don't really have that. So our kids come with us everywhere. I have a feeling in hindsight that will be like, oh, sweet memories of the kids coming with us. But in the moment, you just have to have patience and know that everything's going to take twice as long. One thing that I didn't do was I was not very good at keeping up with my emails just because especially in the lead up to the event, there was a lot of emails and I missed out on the window of opportunity to paint your booth or have them paint your booth for a small fee. Um, because I missed that window, I had to paint my own booth and I didn't paint it, I just used vinyl wraps, but I put pink wraps up. They didn't damage the wall or anything, so I was able to do that. I did get approval, make sure you get approval for anything that seems invasive or out of the ordinary. Again, you're gonna to wanna to read and stay updated on the emails, <laughs> at least better than what I did. But we installed, my husband and I took turns walking with the kids and the other one would hang up the wall stuff. And then we brought a small ladder, a toolbox, a leveler, make sure you bring that. Anytime you hang up art, you want it to look as nice as possible, not only for the people who are going to be there, but because you can use these photos basically indefinitely to show that you've shown your work in public places and the more professional it can look, the better. It's definitely not necessary. You can just show up with a basket of work and you know charm people and show your artwork that way. But if you have a chance, if you have the ability to make it look really nice and professional, basically like your own little gallery, it's definitely worth the effort to try to do so. Then we hung up the artwork. I had a rough plan of how I wanted things to be organized. So I just sort of went off of that rough sketch. We hung everything up. It looked amazing. I had a table. Make sure when you're setting up, you find and incorporate a way to hide your purse, your tools. You'll need to maybe finagle things mid-show, especially if you're gonna be there for four days and things sell. That way you can nail in the wall and adjust as you go. It's really important. Also, I was able to hide my water bottle and the sale sheets and everything like that underneath. You'd be surprised how much junk you kind of need <laughs> during the day to day. And it's just nice to have something to cover that. I used these little stretchy sheets that you find on Amazon. I will try to link that for you guys. I stretched them over a table that I've had forever it's a little foldable plastic table and because it was covered and I put like tinsel around it, I was able to hide a lot of stuff under there. I also brought one of those little V-fold print displays. Those are really helpful. I have checked on Craigslist for them and every once in a while someone will be selling them. Sometimes you have to paint it and doctor it up a little bit, but that's a great thing to have if you're planning on doing these with any frequency. And then of course, finally, I hung up a little disco ball in the corner. I had to ask permission for that, but it was no big deal. Uh, make sure you always ask for permission with this kind of stuff. And the booth looked amazing. It was really good for photos. I took uh, my DSLR camera, I took really nice photos. I can put them on the website. I can use those photos to go to other art shows. One thing is if you plan on doing this with any frequency, you sort of have to have photos of previous art displays in order to get into more shows. So if you take one thing, no, two things from this whole thing, the most important things, get an email list, take everyone's email and take photos, take photos, take photos of you in your booth, um, take as many photos as humanly possible. Another tip is that I made friends with people around me, you know, coworkers, if you will. And we made a pact to take pictures of each other during the process. So if somebody came up to her, a group of people, and she was talking about her art, that's a great photo to get. So I would snap pictures on my phone of her. And at the end of the day, we would text photos to each other. It doesn't have to be with a DSLR camera, but you can use those for social media. It's really helpful. I am a shy-ish person. I don't like to ask people for favors, and especially if I don't know them very well, but it was worth 
summoning the, the courage to ask for that because now I can use those photos forever. All right, let's talk a little bit more about the day, any tips, what it looked like. So after I set up, then I had four days and the days were pretty long. They depended on the day, the hours were slightly different, but they were between five and six, seven hour days. So make sure you wear comfortable shoes. You know, I you're spending a lot of time on your feet. I had a little bar stool, but I still ended up standing and talking to people 90% of the time. So make sure you're dressed comfortable. Also keep an eye on what the temperature is. I dress, I, my dress up clothes tends to be kind of for warm weather. I'm in central Texas and for some reason, uh, like a flaw I have is always thinking everything's gonna be 85 degrees and it's not. So make sure you have the ability to be warm or cool depending on where you're at, especially if it's outdoors. You're probably gonna have to bring layers. Just make sure you think about the layers and what you wanna wear, what you wanna be photographed in, and just plan accordingly. Another thing is make sure you bring water. One thing is because this year, 2021, they had cut back so much because of COVID. They usually had like a pass for artists to get lunch and to have waters. They did not have that this time around, which is fine. I never expect stuff like that, but make sure you bring your own water bottle because there was nowhere to refill water. You had to buy water and it was like pretty expensive. So make sure you plan accordingly. Make sure you have a way to get food. My husband was able to go and get me food, but if you were doing the solo, that might, you may have to leave all your artwork to go get food. And if that's something you're not comfortable with, make sure you find a way to arrange that. Usually art markets have volunteers or people who will help you watch your booth. I find that a lot of times it's really hard to find those people, especially like at lunchtime, everyone wants to go eat lunch. <laughs> so I never plan on that. I sort of hope for that, but I find it's better to sort of make plans in case that doesn't happen because that's actually a pretty challenging process, at least from what I can find. Or that can be a pretty challenging process, or at least it has been for me. Maybe I should speak up more. Who knows? At the other art fair, they also gave us a guarantee that the place would be locked up and safe and that your artwork would be protected by them. So I felt safe leaving all of my artwork there. Of course, I took my wallet and all of that stuff. If you're really nervous about your artwork getting stolen, let's say you are have art that has really high-end stuff built into it, maybe it's like diamonds or gilding or I, I don't know, I'm totally spitballing. You know, maybe look and see in the contract what the insurance policy is like for that. If something does get broken or stolen, are you responsible for it? Are they responsible for it? I am not the most responsible person in the world. And so I have no clue what that policy looks like, but I do remember getting an email that they said that they guaranteed. So if you're more finicky with legal stuff, definitely look into that. But they said that they would watch everything. I didn't have anything stolen. No one I knew had anything stolen, but that's something so you can keep all your stuff there overnight. Not every art market is like that. I have gone to some where I took all my work with me in between the days. Make sure you just account for that. That's a really hard process. So it's a lot of work. I'm usually sore after these things. <laughs> This leads me kind of into my next point, which is morale and what are your goals and things like that. So I'm bringing this up now because it was by day two of three that I was starting to realize that perhaps I wasn't going to sell anything. Usually art markets I go to are much more successful, but I, again, to my earlier point, I brought a lot of pink and girly and teenage to an art market that was dominated by older. <laughs> it just wasn't a demographic fit. I had a lot of people come up and, you know, a lot of artists really liked my work. And I think it was still beneficial because as an artist, it's your job to sort of show up and go to these things within reason, if it's something you can afford to do, especially if your primary domain is online, which mine is. So for me, even if I didn't sell a single thing, which I didn't sell a single original, it would still be a benefit for me to show up in physical spaces. That's something I really have to work at as an artist because so much of what I do is online and it's definitely a goal for me to show up and be real and be in person and show people that I'm not just cranking up the saturation on all my work, that it's really big in real life and that it really is that bright and so doing these art markets is a great way to sort of show that for me the cost was worth that alone i will say in terms of morale another thing that's really great is you get to do a lot of really good networking so much of being an artist is so lonely <laughs> so isolated that getting to go and feel like you have co-workers again and that you're rubbing elbows with people who have connections and 
are excited about your work. That was really exciting for me. I don't know if I would pay $4,000 just to feel that by itself, but it definitely was worth a lot to be able to do that. And, you know, I knew some of the people who were already there. I got to meet lots of new, and I have continued to get benefits from those encounters. And, you know, an art career is a long game. You really benefit from knowing and making good relationships with people over the years. It's less about what can you do for me right now this year and more building those authentic relationships and, you know, admiring people and learning how <laughs> to work with each other and help each other in an authentic way. So I know that sounds really fluffy, but it's, it's incredibly important. I am not a spectacularly good networker. I just really struggle with things feeling not authentic but I find that art markets are a good way to rub elbows with people who share similar themes and ideas and interests as you do. And so for me, marketing is easier that way versus just DMing people on TikTok and Instagram and just that kind of networking has always seemed kind of skeezy. Now, I'm not saying like, don't feel like you can't reach out to me, but me with a big platform reaching out to someone to want something just feels, I don't know not sincere. <laughs> so for that reason, I think networking is really important. And that's just with the artist. I will say networking also with people. Plenty of people came up to me who were in art adjacent businesses like designers and things like that. And we exchanged business cards and they're now subscribed to my email list. And you know, you never know if those relationships are going to turn into something. I will say most of the time when I do art markets, I also will procure commissions from it so people who come by and they like my work and they want me to paint something a little more specific to them and commissions are great they are a wonderful consistent form of income so even just that aspect alone usually pays for itself again I don't think I was a good fit for the Dallas market but I still don't know you can I mean it's not unlikely to hear from someone two years later and say okay we're ready to buy something now I mean art is expensive and people aren't always ready to throw down you know five thousand dollars <laughs> and then the final thing I'll say about networking is it's always beneficial to work with these big companies and these organizations that are really geared towards helping artists and connecting artists and buyers and so I think it's also nice that Saatchi and I are a little bit closer after this and so for that reason too I think you know networking even with like businesses can be a very helpful thing. Now let's move on to the cons or the drawbacks. So specifically with the other art fair in Dallas I think part of what happened was really affected by COVID and the protocols and specifically moving it down the road several times. From what I can tell being someone who's online and releases things that that can really hinder excitement. I also believe it dug into the budget quite a bit, which of course all those things are going to affect turnout and your experience. So I feel like I can't make a full assessment on what the other art fair is like. I will say I am probably still going to do another art fair. I just probably will pick a different city. When I was talking to other artists, a lot of them said, depending on the city, is it really changes your experience. I was a couple booths down from a lady who is from New York City and she does all of the other art fairs and she was saying that the crowd dramatically differs from city to city. So that might be something to, worth looking into. I've thought about Brooklyn or LA and so that's, I probably would never do Dallas again, but I would consider doing one of those cities. The biggest con is the price, right? Working artists, especially if you're starting out, a lot of what you do is on a shoestring budget. So much of what I did the first three or four years of being an artist, definitely the first few years of being a full-time artist, I was working with razor thin margins. And so to spend something, you know, $3,000, $2,000 was a huge investment. It still is, but I was able to be confident with my decision to do the other art fair because ultimately I could risk losing all that money and if you don't look at the silver lining I didn't sell anything other than a handful of prints so <laughs> it was in that way lost money I'm air quoting because I still see value in it you a lot, a lot of times can't invest in those other values such as networking and being in a visible space as an artist if you need to pay your bills it's just it's it kind of the one thing I wanted to address in this video 
is how much of a privilege it is to even get to be a working artist. And I definitely want to talk about that. And I don't think it's something swept under the rug. I think you could say, well, if it's, if it's worth it, if you have the money for it. But I think that's sort of turning a blind eye to how hard it is to really get your art business off the ground, especially if you don't have you know, a husband who has income or parents who can fund what you're doing. If you're like me and you are the breadwinner, you know, your husband helps you full time and you don't have family helping you. It's, it is a harder risk to make and to take. And, you know, the part that makes it so I think insidious is that it's people who are willing to risk losing that money to make those connections and to move their career forward that are going to have a better opportunity at having an art career. And the people who probably need those connections the most probably can't afford to gamble away $2,000. So, you know, I just feel I would be remiss if I didn't say that. That being said, if you, if you can risk potentially losing that money and, you know, you still feel like you would walk away with connections and things like that, I definitely encourage entering art markets. So, of course, pricing is like the biggest con. It's the most obvious con the risk of not making um, any money. I, I think if making income was guaranteed, more people would do art markets, but it's not. And I think that, that for me is the biggest issue when I consider going to art markets, I have to consider if potentially losing out on all that money is worth it. And for some people it's not, and I totally get that. It's time intensive. Um, that is a full week that I was not able to paint and I, that really affects me because I do so much on social media and I have to produce content. It is nice to take a week off of making artwork, but um, obviously that's something you have to think about. Another con is that it's pretty labor intensive. So I am fortunately able-bodied for the most part. And so I am able to do a lot of heavy lifting and moving and my husband was able to help me. And so that was something I didn't have to think too much about. But if you struggle with chronic illness or you have any disabilities, that's going to be a challenge. Of course, always feel free to reach out to the people running the organization to see if you can get any help or assistance. I would assume most good quality organizations have a way to help disabled people. They should, that should be a guarantee, but it's always worth asking and reaching out, especially before you pay, just so you know. And the last con is kind of, I feel silly including it, but I'm going to include it anyways. You will get a lot of really good feedback. For the most part, people who are excited to go look at art are going to go and be happy and get to look at art, but not everyone is happy. <laughs> Like for sure, I should know this from being on the internet for so long. And people will say some pretty out of pocket things to you. <laughs> so you just have to prepare yourself for people to say potentially unkind things and hear that. I don't think I've always been in a mental state where I can hear that a lot. So I have to personally space out my in-person events because of that. And especially art markets. I notice that whenever I do gallery openings where I have like a group show or something, people tend to be a little kinder to you or like say less out of pocket things. But something about being in an art market, people look at you less as an artist, more as a vendor. And I think it's interesting, says a lot about our class system in America, but I find that people say more out of pocket stuff when you're in that setting, which is really interesting. And, you know, I definitely had people say some things that I, I, I mean, I'm just really sensitive, but if you're sensitive like me, I feel like you would want to hear this, but I had people say some things that were pretty out of pocket and definitely hurt my feelings for a little bit. You know, at the end of the day, I love what I'm doing and I'm pretty happy and steadfast in what I'm doing. So it doesn't affect me too much. And luckily the artists around me, we kind of commiserated, but you know, if you go and show pink, bright pink, colorful things in a city like Dallas, <laughs> you're, you're going to hear some you're going to learn why people don't like pink very much. So there's that. <laughs> okay. I hope that was helpful. I hope that gave you guys some insight into the other art fair, my experience. Again, this isn't a video that answers all the questions about art markets. It's just kind of my opinion, my insight. It's a starting point. If you're doing research, I'll try to remember some of those links down below and maybe you can keep looking there. The gold standards is always going to be to reach out to the company that's doing or the organization that's doing the art market and then reaching out to artists who've done that market in the past, that's gonna be your gold standard. They're gonna tell you a lot about the customers and what it was like in the previous years, although that's not a guarantee. The other art fair Dallas I went to was the second year of them doing that and apparently the year, a couple years prior was very, very, very successful and this year 
wasn't as successful. So, you know, do your research and make sure that you're willing to make that financial gamble. And if you feel like you can't do art markets yet, don't feel too bad. I don't think they are necessary in being an artist at all. It's just a feature. It's just an option that you have, but I think it can be a pretty good option. So thanks for being here. I hope that was helpful. Have a great rest of your day and I'll see you in the next video.